All right, good morning, boys. Let me introduce our guest today. Good morning. This is Mr. Diaguardi. There is an old Albanian saying that, that goes, Atikushka liri benji de spiriti dan in de bima pauja, which means, where there is no freedom, the mind and soul dry up like a plant without water. In addition, there's an old Italian adage that offers La misericordia più forte de veleno, compassion is stronger than poison. And finally, the preamble of the Declaration of Independence sets forth the foundational principles on which America was founded, that all men are created equal and that they, they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. If there is anyone who can claim to understand these words in their original languages at that, and to have devoted his life to their implications. That man would be former Congressman Joseph Diaguardi, class of 1958. Mr. Diaguardi's father came from Greci, or Kutundi, an Albanian-speaking village near Naples, uh, which was de settled by descendants of soldiers who had arrived to defend Italy in the 15th century. Mr. Diaguardi's mother came from Bari, which is in the heel part of the Italian boot. And so Mr. Diaguardi grew up in a trilingual home in the Bronx, along with his sister Angela and his brother. During his prep years, Dio, as he was called by his buddies, served with the honor guard, sang with the prep choir, was a member of the German and science clubs. He also competed with the speech and debate team and devoted time to the spiritual dimensions of the school life with the Knights of the Blessed Sacrament. With his family business being just that, a family business, Mr. Diaguardi often helped at the grocery shop on Tremont Avenue after school and weekends, an important part of his teenage years that would help to shape his sense of commitment and responsibility as he was growing up. After graduating the prep in 1958, Mr. Diaguardi remained at Rose Hill for college, graduating with honors in 1962 from Fordham's College of Business Administration, today known as the Gabelli School of Business. Even before graduation, he began a long association with Arthur Anderson and Company as an intern. Staying with the firm, he became a certified public accountant in 1965, became a manager in 1967, and was admitted as a partner in 1972. As a devoted alumnus, in 1980, Mr. Diaguardi began a five-year stint on the Fordham Prep Board of Trustees. After more than two decades with Arthur Anderson, Joe Diaguardi began his career in politics in the mid-1980s, becoming the first ever CPA elected to Congress in November 1984. Congressman Diaguardi took the lead in sounding the call for truth in federal budgeting, accounting, and reporting, and in bringing financial accountability to Capitol Hill. He was the original author of the Chief Financial Officers Act, signed by President George Bush in 1990, which mandated the assignment of a CFO to each major department and agency of the U.S. government. Completing his term in Congress in 1989, Mr. Diaguardi established Truth in Government, a nonpartisan foundation whose mission is to demand transparency and fiscal responsibility from elected officials. In 1992, he published Uncountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Updated and republished in 2008, it continues to blow the whistle on what the former congressman points out as irresponsible budgeting practices. A man of great compassion, Mr. Diaguardi has also devoted himself to the causes of human rights and dignity. He was the first member of Congress to bring the, the, the issue of Albanian rights in the Balkans to the attention of the U.S. government and was also responsible for the first congressional hearing on Kosovo in 1987. Since his term in office, he has served as the founding president as the Albanian American Civil League and has made dozens of trips to the Balkans. Mr. Diaguardi remains a tireless advocate for the Albanian people and the Albanian American community, the Italian American community, and the people of Westchester and of New York at large. Since 1986, he has also been an advocate for African American war heroes who had been unfairly denied the Medal of Honor during World War I and World War II. As of Congressman uh, Diaguardi's in induction to the Prep Hall of Honor last year, nine forgotten heroes had their justly earned uh, honors restored, including a New Yorker, Sergeant Henry Johnson, who was posthumously granted his medal in June of 2015. 
Mr. Diaguardi currently resides in Osning, New York. He has two adult children, John, who is a substance abuse counselor, and a daughter, Kara, a songwriter and music producer, whom you might remember as one of the judges from American Idol. And so I will introduce now and turn this over to our brother alum, Mr. Joseph Diaguardi. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am, I am so happy to be back here. You know, I spent eight years on this wonderful campus, starting in 1954 and then continuing uh, at the School of Business in 1958, graduating, as you can see, in 1962. And what an experience it was for me as the son of immigrants who came here with no education. Dad had a fourth grade education in southern Italy. He was a farm boy. Mom came here with a family in 1910. She was the first one born here, very large Italian family. So my parents met here in the Bronx, believe it or not. And what an experience for me to be raised by people, mom and dad, who were hungry, who wanted to show that they could excel in America without education. And I became the focus. I'm the oldest son of an Italian-American family. And let me tell you, that they dote on the oldest son. And the Albanians, by the way, do the same thing. Uh, so I am very thankful that I had a sister and a brother who supported me in everything. Because they didn't get the attention that I got. And till today, you have no idea how I revere both of them. For help me even get to Congress. When I decided to run, my sister left her job to manage my campaign. And my brother, another CPA, took care of all the reporting. And there's massive reporting and transparency when you run. So here I am. How many years later? 1958, I graduated. And we're going to be, oh, my 60th is coming up next year. My 60th anniversary, graduating from Fordham Prep. And I can't wait to see all my old classmates once again. We, they don't all live in the Bronx anymore, or Westchester County. They, they were all around the country, but they do come in, most of them for that. Why did I come to see you today, and why do I feel this is important for you to hear me? Because I've had your experience here, but I had an experience that goes way beyond what any of you, or most of you, will probably have in your lives. But my feeling is that if you want to be successful, Think big and work hard. My father taught me that. And think about how, in the, in the terms of the grand scheme of things, and this is my Jesuit education, eight years, and I did receive the gold medal, by the way, in philosophy in Fordham University, which is very difficult to do. Straight A's, four years. So I took the philosophy, I took the universal thinking, liberal thinking, as well as accounting. I wanted to, it's almost like I wanted to balance my left brain and my right brain. I wanted to think in terms of universal values, and you'll see it in all I've done with my life. But I also wanted to be the best accountant that Fordham ever graduated. And I think I accomplished that because I became the first certified public accountant ever elected to the US Congress, House or Senate. What does that tell you? Well, I can give you a little smile, Everybody's spending, nobody's counting. That's a big problem for you. And why do I write about the national debt so much? Because it pains me to see what we're doing to the next generation, your generation, by not controlling the way we spend your money, your parents' money, the taxpayers' money. And that's my big message that I brought to Congress. You'll see it in one of the videos. Representative Joseph Diaguardi, 47 years old, second term Republican from New York. 
key challenge in the 100th Congress, accountability in federal spending. I don't think that the public is getting a dollar's worth of goods and services for a dollar's worth of taxes. DeGuardi is a trained accountant and says the way to eliminate government waste and mismanagement is to introduce sound accounting principles. To that end, he's pushed legislation to have a chief federal financial officer appointed for 10-year terms. His job would be to manage the money allocated by Congress. DeGuardi insists congressmen think of their voting cards as credit cards for free shopping sprees. We have today in Congress a credit card mentality. This card, as far as I'm concerned, is the most expensive credit card in the world. This card has no limit. And I think it's important for you to know. You think you know what the national debt is? Oh, it has to be that 20 trillion. We hear about it all the time. It's the statutory debt limit. And we're gonna raise it again because we're spending and we cannot borrow unless we sell treasury bills to China. How do you think we get money when we run out of money? And we run out of money every year. Why? The budget is always exceeded. It's called the annual deficit. What is a deficit? It's what I'm spending that I cannot raise from you and your parents for taxes. And what they do, politicians, very easily, you know what, raise that debt ceiling tell the Treasury to sell more Treasury bills to China, Japan, the American people will have the money because we need the money. We got to keep spending because I'm afraid I might not get elected. My constituents back home think we need to bring the money for this, for that, for this, for that. But when are we going to start thinking in a way that gives us qualitative spending? What do we need to spend our money on that's really important? So that America stays number one as an economic power, as a military power. The waste in our military is incredible. John McCain is a very good friend of mine. Thank God he got reelected in 1980. I'm his advisor on financial management for the Pentagon. There's a plane called F-35 that's already cost us over $500 billion, and it's not working, and we may not get the whole thing done for another two years, and it's going to cost over a trillion dollars. One weapons. Now, I got a little something in one of my websites on that, because you'll see me. Now, you see that handout you have? That handout, if you saw it on my computer, that's why I gave you my credit card, uh, my, oh, forget about credit cards. I gave you my business card. When you get on the computer, every one of those boxes has an, a video that's embedded. And you're going to see the one, see my face on there? I'm speaking truth to power. I did that in my home a couple of weeks ago to tell you why I sent this newsletter after New Year's to my followers, and we put it all over Facebook and whatnot. But in that is embedded a little speech I gave at the Reagan Library two years ago when I was in a room with 600 lobbyists for the defense industry asking for more and more money. Where's this money coming from? Wait till you see what I said to them. I'm not gonna repeat that speech. But you talk about speaking truth to power, that's who I am. I don't care what your power is. I wrote a letter to Trump, it's in there. I wrote a letter to Obama, it's in there. I gave you at least those, they're also on my website. Because I wanted them to know what I thought they should be doing. You can't do that with Mr. Putin. You could be put in jail for speaking the way I speak. But that's the kind of, how would you say, upbringing I had, and that's the kind of education I got from the Jesuits. My heroes include St. Ignatius Loyola and St. Francis of Assisi, but also Thomas Paine and Martin Luther King. And I have a whole list of the people that I have their best, and I'll read some of them later, their best sayings that inspire me. So why did I come here? I didn't come here to inform you. You're being informed very well. You're being educated. I came here to inspire you. You know what that word inspiration means? Inspiration is kind of like an extension of the word enthusiasm. Enthusiasm comes from the Greek, enthusiastic. 
enthusiasm means the spirit within. When you have enthusiasm, you're showing people not only that you're smart, but you have energy, you have spirit, you have a desire to do things, to make the world a better place. So what I want you to become is someone that's inspired, and I'll tell you how you're going to get there, and how you're going to inspire others. And that's the beginning of being a successful human being. Are you going to fulfill your destiny as a Jesuit student here? The way you do it is the way I did it. You need to understand that your role right now is to begin to fill your human potential. Fulfill your potential as a human being, intellectually, spiritually, physically, emotion, uh, socially, and, and emotionally too. All those things. And then you become a well-rounded person. You begin to become really self-confident about who you are. You have self-esteem, and you start to think big, and you start to do big things. But don't worry about that right now. You're at the beginning. This education you're getting is the cornerstone of the rest of your life, like it was for me. It's, I don't think this education is equaled anywhere at the high school level because of the exposure you're having to so many things. And I dare say it's better today than it was because you're being exposed to a lot more. So basically, that's my big message for you today. And now I want to show you how I, as a kid, looked, and you'll see me jumping around, the enthusiasm I had from my parents, from my teachers and whatnot, I carried on in my life. And it even allowed me to think so big that I got into a race in 1984 that no one thought I had any chance of winning because there were 3.5 more registered Democrats than Republicans. Now, does that mean I like parties? No, I don't like parties. I don't like anything that divides America. But I had to, as a conservative, run in that party. But people said, you can't be elected here. You got a huge African-American population in Mount Vernon and, and New Rochelle and Yonkers. You have a huge, very active Jewish population. They are not pro-life. You're pro-life, except for the Orthodox. I had, a, I had so many people whispering in my ear, why are you doing this? I said, you know what? I was successful in business. I'm going to figure out what it's going to take to win against long odds. And I won on election day by 1,000 votes out of 300,000, when everybody said it was impossible. And I kept it. People say, Joe, how come you left? It wasn't my desire to leave. I lost by the same amount because the Democrats worked so hard to get me out of there. They thought, what is this guy doing here when a Republican never had the seat? Now, I don't even want to mention parties. But the point is, that old district I had doesn't exist anymore. Every 10 years, it changes. And today, it's, but what they did to get me out, they put my district across the Long Island Sound in another situation where it was difficult for me to get the votes I needed. So just to tell you, that was one of my challenges. But did I quit? No. I decided to carry on my congressional agenda with two foundations, a registered lobby, and a PAC, a political action committee, which I call a public affairs committee. I don't like that word, political. All right? So for 25 years, ever since leaving Congress in 1990, 1989, I have done probably more than most congressmen could hope to do because they're worried about raising money. And by the way, I don't get paid for this. I'm a missionary. I do this as a citizen. But they don't have the time that I have. They have to run for votes that they don't even like sometimes. But their party says, you got to vote that way. And they got to raise money to get reelected. They got their families in one place, and, they, and they're in Washington. I had two lives, in effect. I had to go to Washington, and I stayed there for three or four days, and I had to come back to my district. Joining us now is Joe Dioguardi, a former U.S. congressman, now with the Albanian American Civic League. Why didn't they sign, and, and what does agreement in principle really amount to, do you think? Well, they didn't sign for a simple reason, because the agreement as it stands now would be nothing less than a death warrant for the Albanian Kosovars. You have to remember how this began. It began in 1987 when Slobodan Milosevic rose to power by coming to Kosovo on a platform of anti-Albanian racism and greater Serbia. He occupied Kosovo in 1989 
took away all the jobs, all the schools, all the courts, the separate uh, parliament of Kosovo. Everything was removed. The Kosovars have lived in a concentration camp for 10 years. There's been nothing like this since Adolf Hitler created the concentra uh, concentration camps in Germany. Uh, they cannot go back. They have declared their independence in a referendum in 1991. The Slovenes did, and they got out. The Croatians did, and they got out. The Bosnians did, and they got out. And by the way, they are all Slavs, just like the Serbs. The Albanians are not Slavs. Why should they be forced to live with people who treat them like undimensioned? I even have one here where I'm yelling at Senator Biden. I'm teaching him in 1998 at a hearing, and he's now the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but for years and years he bought all the propaganda from Belgrade, Putin's friends, the Slavs, and I'm telling him, you have been misinformed. And he's yelling at me, I'm yelling back at him. Three years later, in 2002, we have a big dinner in the Sheridan Hotel, we make him the honoree, he turns to me and my wife, you opened my eyes, okay? And he became one of our biggest supporters. The Pentagon is saying now that uh, absolutely no consideration is given or is being given to sending in troops either from Canada or the United States. Well, we already have a force in Macedonia. Uh, I can't believe that they're not considering right now to expand that force, uh, that, that protection force made up now of uh, U.S. troops and Norwegian troops. I believe it totals about 600. Uh, it seems to me that the only answer right now is to show resolve. We didn't show it for two years in Bosnia, and we lost 200,000 people, and we had a, a, a conflagration there, second to none. The ministers of the European Union are suggesting that further sanctions should be imposed in Belgrade. Is that going to work? Sanctions don't seem to work with Mr. Milosevic. That's what the hearing was all about. We did get a very tough resolution. It was made even tougher because of the efforts of the Albanian-American Civic League that represents the concerns of 400,000 ethnic Albanians here in America. But sanctions will not be enough. We need to show resolve. We this should move an aircraft carrier off the coast of Montenegro. Let it stay there. We should ring Serbia with troops. Let them stay there. If we see one move, and don't forget, Ralph, two presidents drew a line in the sand. President Bush on the way out and President Clinton on the way in said if there's any military or paramilitary action in Kosovo, we would move swiftly. That question was put to Mr. Gelbard, Ambassador Gelbard, and he said that foreign policy declaration is still in effect. This is not a sovereign state as far as the Albanians are concerned. Uh, that's Kosovo is uh, an independent state already. Right. This has to be recognized. But Congressman, you're, you're supporting the idea. If we're going to bomb Kosovo and surrounding uh, areas to end genocide, why don't you make the case, and why wouldn't you be critical of the president if that is our stated goal and mission, that maybe, maybe we have to use military troops and ground forces if it would help, and why are we telegraphing all of this to our enemies anyway? Well, there's no question that's what this rally was all about. Uh, we had some 10,000 Albanian Americans today that were saying that we need to arm the KLA mm -hmm. and that we should do that immediately. We did this to the Croatians in Bosnia. Why can't we do it to the KLA? Let them take out those surface-to-air missiles and the mm -hmm. tanks. And then, yes, we got to get on with the next phase, which is to commit the ground troops. Right, people were killed in the meantime by the time they did Yes, it? and that's going to happen in Kosovo. That's why I want to know what you're suggesting now. What we have to do right now is to enforce international law. We have war criminals in Belgrade. We're dealing with one right now. I said that article before. I have a copy of it right here. Here it is. It was in the Gannett papers on Sunday. There's Slobodan Milosevic. Side by side, Mr. Karadzic, who's now got a book coming out, pointing the finger at him for all these atrocities in Bosnia. Why aren't we picking him up? Don't be afraid to tell truth to power, but you've got to be prepared. Don't be an idiot to think you've got to go after a windmill uh, every day. No, you've got to be prepared. You've got to decide what it is you think really matters to you. And are you becoming really good at that, like I did for accounting, so that later, you could tell the best people in the world, including the president, your accounting system stinks. You're not representing the people. Their money is being wasted. That's what I've done for 29 years. I have no titles anymore because a lot of people think that I went too far, not me. I know that when I'm gone, people are going to remember me because I did speak up. And I think your Jesuit education is the beginning of that. It was the beginning of that for me. Thank God I joined the debate society as a freshman. And I remember for the first year, all I did was read from the cards because I didn't know those issues. What are we going to spend our money on? 
In those years, in 1955, the issue was, are we going to spend it on guns or butter? And I had the senior who was on that team write it out for me so I could read it. But it gave me confidence to get in front of audiences doing that. So you got to stretch yourself. And that, to me, that was a big stretch. My family, I mean, they didn't speak you know, broken English, but many words I had to learn in the prep because they weren't spoken in my neighborhood. English words, they weren't spoken in my family. And I remember Father Faye telling me one day when I told him that, he said, Joe, get Reader's Digest and look at all the words, word power, and read it out loud to your parents so you got the right diction and whatnot. And I did that for three years. I never told people that. And I started to get a feel that I could speak properly and match those rich kids from Westchester County when I was a, a poor kid you know, from the Bronx in those days. So I'm telling you that you should not let anybody tell you what you cannot do. You, with this education, are going to be prepared to do anything you invest your time in. You invest your, your emotion, your, your beliefs, and you're going to find those things. And why is it important for me to tell you that now? You should do what I did. Do the best you can now. If you can't get straight A's, come close. Do the same in college. Because the, why? Later on, when you want a job, or when you find something that you really like, what are they going to look at? They're going to look at your performance. They want to see your record. How did this individual do in high school and college, besides the test that they take to get in? Is this someone I can depend on to perform? to pay them the money he wants or she wants. This happens to be a male school, but that's important. So you build a record, and if you build it consistently, you develop people who believe in you, who want you to be their partners, and want you to work for them. And little by little, you become more confident in yourself. You pick up self-esteem because now you're practicing. An accounting professor one time told me, because I said, why is theory so important? I like counting when I could see things adding up two and two. And you know what he told me? And you should write this down later. He says, Joe, theory animates practice, but practice perfects theory. Think about that. It applies to everything in life. You got to think about the big picture. Theory is thinking of things conceptually. Why is that important? Because it animates. I love that word from the Latin, animus. It animates Practice, but don't forget practice. It makes perfect. Practice then perfects theory. Beautiful. Don't you think so? Okay. So, um, can we just see the beginning of the Hall of Honor thing, or is it too late? All right. Well, maybe that's better. You know, how, how do we get that? You know what? We should give them the link to the Hall of Honor speech, you all have computers, right? So you could see it there. I think you've seen enough of me already, I think. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, but go ahead, yeah, any questions you have, please, shoot. All right. Yeah. Which president, Bush or Trump? <laughs> yeah. Right. Speak up. No, no, no. If you, now, you got my book, right? Look at the appendix to my book, the letter I wrote to President Reagan's chief of staff, Howard Baker. Senator Howard Baker left, became his chief of staff, where I was telling him, you got it before you be, get called the biggest deficit spender ever, because already people are saying you are, because you just had a deficit of $200 billion. By the way, we've had deficits in a row now of over $1 trillion. In those days, they thought $200 billion was just you know, sacrilege. So here I'm writing the letter, make sure you straighten out the books and report everything. The problem today is the accounting system they're using that they publicize. This cash basis that tells you the statutory debt limit is 20 trillion, it doesn't include at least $50 trillion of unfunded, unrecorded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, federal pensions, civil service pensions, but you're gonna to have to pay for that unless someone walks away from it, and no one's gonna walk away from it without losing their seat or disturbing the 
peaceful tranquility of America. So that's what my whole thing is about. It's not just how you spend the money. Tell the public what you're spending and use the real accounting system that the accounting profession uses when they have to do the audits of General Motors, General Electric. It's called Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. It's there. It's been developed for 100 years. Why should you reinvent a new one? But the politicians love the other system because they can manipulate it. They cash basis accounting is, I can accelerate income to look good. I can defer expenses. And by the way, I don't want to give the public all this information because they may not vote for me. They may think it was my fault, even though it started with Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1968. It's complicated, but it's an area that I'm an expert in because I told you I was in two Marine Corps. The Catholics, the Jesuits here at Fordham and in the world are the Marines of the Catholic Church. The discipline I got here, you can only get from the Marines at Camp Lejeune. It's an analogy. But I also was with the Marines of the accounting profession, Arthur Anderson. And you might say, well, what happened to it? That problem with Enron. Yeah, but I left 18 years before that. And you talk about a big mistake that the government made because young prosecutors wanted to have another notch on their gun. gun. They go after the whole firm instead of the three partners down in Houston on Enron. And believe it or not, the firm was exonerated a year later, nine to zero by the Supreme Court, but their image was terribly impaired so that they had to go out of business. 50,000 people lost their jobs. But that's 18 years uh, after I left Arthur Anderson. But learn more about accounting. That's why, by the way, I brought certain things here. He talked, they talked about the CFO Act, right? Here's an article I just wrote, the CFO Act 25 years later. I'm telling Congress, do the right thing. When you pass the act that I put in, you dumbed it down. You took out generally accepted accounting principles. You took out the independence of the chief financial officer. Put it back. And I told that to Trump in that letter that you have. And I said to Trump in another conversation, if you, I don't want a job. God forbid I take a government job. That's not who I am. But I would work for $1 if he would lobby with me to put this bill so that we have. The United States does not have a chief financial officer, believe it or not, a real one like corporations have. But if he worked with me and do that, I would help him, I would do it for a buck, and then I, I, I think that would be the capstone of everything I've done as a CPA. Now Obama, I challenged him because for nine, I don't have enough of these to give out. But look at this, I'm supposed to be a conservative Republican, I hate these labels, but I did something that the Democrats couldn't do. Over 30 years I got nine Medals of Honor, they call it the Congressional Medal of Honor? No, that's the wrong term. It's the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest military award. A black historian, Leroy Ramsey, came to my office. Joe, I sent you a letter through Governor Cuomo. It's 1986, and to make it short, I said, well, you know, repeat what that letter was. He says, well, a million 550,000 African Americans, black Americans served in World War I and World War II, and not one, not one got our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor, even though hundreds were recommended. I said, Dr. Ramsey, I'm a CPA and those numbers don't add up. Why? He says, Joe, did you know there was segregation in World War I and World War II? I says, no. No one ever taught me that. And I have a good education from Fordham Prep, Fordham University, you know, and I'm a, basically a kid from the Bronx. No one ever, I had to learn this in Congress. When I heard this, I personally went on fire, and I said, I'm gonna go to the head of the Black Caucus, and I did, Mickey Leland. I told him about this guy, Sergeant Johnson, from Albany, New York. He says, Joe, I've seen you here on the floor. You're my kind of guy. Let's put in Seaman Dory Miller from Houston, Texas, and let's do it. So I started in 1986 with the chairman of the Black Caucus. People in those days didn't find it that easy to go across the lines either. And guess what? This beautiful man, Mickey Leland, died in 1989 delivering food to Ethiopia, to the poorest of the poor. And I carried this on in his memory. I'm up to medal number 10. I've gotten nine medals. Now, this is on my website, but I brought a few books. Certainly, I see some African Americans in the crowd. I hope you take this and pass the word around that these are things that have to be done, even though you think that's not the political thing I should be doing, or maybe that's not what I'm here for. No, 
If you feel that something is so bad, look at John Lewis, what he said. Why didn't he attend? He said, when something is not fair, not just, not truth, you got to speak up. And that's what he did. And he didn't attend. That's his right. I wish everybody would have attended. So I could go on for hours telling you about that. One day I have to write a book about this. I'm so active even today, I don't have time to write a book, but I have to write a book about this experience. But it's there on my website. And you'll see hundreds of articles, you'll see many of my speeches, radio shows, TV shows, on the issue of truth and accounting, especially. And then if you're interested in human rights, you have to go to the other website, which is the Albanian American Civic League. Gentlemen, before you go, I just want you to extend a word of gratitude to the Honorable Joe DiGuardi, class of 58. As a small token of our gratitude, on behalf of the Fordham Prep community, thank you for your civic service, for your charitable giving, and for your generosity as a true man for others. Thank you.